Hello and welcome everybody. In this video we will start learning how to generate random numbers which are from distributions different from the uniform distribution. When we learned in the last video how uniformly distributed samples are generated, we used these complicated procedures and the complicated argument that we cannot really generate random samples on a computer. So instead we generated samples which we argued are good enough as a replacement. So this was not a very mathematical argument and it is something, uh, it is a thought which needs a bit of getting used to. So in the following sections we could start over again and look for similar methods which would generate say normal distributed or exponentially distributed random variables. But instead what we'll do is we will learn about methods for transforming uniformly distributed random variables to get different distributions. And the advantage of this is that from now on we are standing on firm ground. The methods we learn are mathematically solid and they're guaranteed if you plug in actual random samples from a uniform distribution then you get exactly samples from the desired distribution out. And in these methods we will plug in our samples which are good enough to replace samples from a uniform distribution, so the output from a pseudo random number generator. But since we argue they are good enough, these transformations will do the right thing and we will still get samples from the desired distributions. There are different methods to achieve this which we will discuss. And in this video we will start with section 1.3 where we introduce the inverse transform method. So let me write this. The aim is to convert standard uniformly distributed random variable u into x from a given distribution on the real line. So that's what we want to do. And the first question is this algorithm, which I'm going to write in a few minutes, that will somehow need to know which distribution we want. So we need to somehow decide how are we going to specify the distribution x should have. And since we are on the real line, the easiest way is to use the cumulative distribution function. Let me just remind you, the cumulative distribution function or CDF in short is given by for every a the probability that x is less than or equal to a. So that's the CDF of a random variable x and it turns out that characterizes the distribution of x completely. If you know all of these probabilities then there is only one choice what x can do. So just for illustration for example if we want to know what the probability that x is in an interval a, b, then we know that the probability of x less than b minus the probability of x less than a, and that's in terms of f, f of b minus f of a. And it turns out closed intervals and all questions about x, you can answer using the distribution function by just using slightly more difficult tools. But if we know f, we have specified the distribution of x and that is what we are going to do here in this section. Let me just jump to the main result. I'll write it first and then bit by bit we will go through what that actually means and how it works. So the main result is the following proposition. That is proposition 1.14 in the book. And this says if we start with a uniformly distributed u and we define x to be f inverse of u where f is the cdf then x has cdf f. So that's the result we will discuss here and which I'm going to prove in a little while. So it does everything we hoped it would do. We need to know capital F the cdf and we need as input a uniformly distributed random variable u. Then using f we compute x from u. We take f inverse we need to speak a bit about this. And if we do that, then we get that the x we just computed from u using f has distribution function f, which means it has the correct distribution. So that really solves the problem once we only have understood how that is done. First thing we need to discuss is the f inverse. Let me just do a sketch of f. So f is the probability that x is less than or equal to a given value. So the probability we automatically know that will be between 0 and 1. Also when we look if a goes to infinity then that should go to 1 because x will be smaller than some number. So if you put in larger and larger a's then more and more of the probability should be covered. So if we go to the right then we know f either will reach 1 or at least it will asymptotically approach 1. 
Similarly to the left, it can either reach zero or will asymptotically approach zero. So let's here just say it actually equals zero for a while. Then in between, we know if A increases, that's an increasing when CDF will be increasing. So we have an increasing function there, so it goes like that. It can stay flat if there's a range where X doesn't take values and it can have jumps that corresponds to points where X takes a value with positive probability. So that is for the discrete case and that's what it does. So comes to the left from zero, either asymptotically or it actually starts out at zero, then it increases, it may have jumps and then to the right it approaches one. And at the location of a jump, I drew here a full circle and an empty circle, it always takes the upper value because again that corresponds to a value which is taken with positive probability and I wrote smaller or equal to here. So that means at the point that's already included, so at the point we take the upper value. That's what I mean by the full circle here. So that's what a cumulative distribution function looks like. Now we need to explain what does it mean to take the inverse of f. And you see that is not entirely trivial because there are two complications. There may be jumps and there may be flat bits. And in both cases there is no one-to-one -one relationship. So going from x to f of x is not necessarily always invertible. Let's just go through the cases. So the first case is points where f actually is invertible. Say if x is here and f of x is here, then there is a one-to-one -one relationship between x and f of x. So if that here is u, then that point down here would be f inverse of u. And in points where the curve has no jump and is actually increasing, that's how we find f inverse. There is no choice here. The second case is where there is a jump. Say x is here. Then it is clear f of x is here. But if we think about the inverse, so the inverse of the point I labeled f of x clearly should be x. But if we think about this point u, which I drew, which will fall into the gap, if you think what should be the inverse of this b, well, if we try to go from the f of x axis down to the x axis from u, it seems clear that we need to end up at where I drew x. So this x should also be f inverse of u. Again, there's little choice, that's just how we should do it if we think how do we go from u to x. There is no other x which we could reasonably assign. But here it's already not bijective, so if I do u, then f inverse of u to go to x, and then I apply f again, then I end up here and I do not get back to u, but I end up at f of x again. But no problem, we want to define the inverse. The inverse for u, there is really no choice. We should define x, and that's what we'll do with the formal definition in a second. Now, the last case are flat bits, so let me just do an x here. Then f of x, there is no question, will be here. And now the question is if we go backwards, because if I pick a u here and I ask what should be the pre-image, so what should be f inverse of u, then any point in this interval seems like a reasonable choice. That is all points which map to u. So either of these points we could say is a pre-image of u. And we just need to settle on one and what we will use for the algorithm is the leftmost possible point. So we will say in a second f inverse of u is here. But again there was a choice here. Any of these points would have been a possible inverse and that's the reason that we need to be a bit pedantic with the definition. Namely here we want the left hand one so we need to write a definition which gives us the left hand point here which in this case we see jump where there is no ambiguity, we know f inverse of u should be x for any of these, but still we need to write a definition which does not collapse in this case. For example, we cannot write the x such that f of x equals u, that wouldn't work for this u. And this definition for the regular case where f is increasing and has no jump, there what we should get is the obvious choice, like I drew in the picture. We, here we should get the u such that f of x equals u. So how can we do that? It needs a bit of fiddling, but the definition which does all of that mathematically can be written as f inverse of u is defined as the smallest x in R such that f of x greater or equal to u. And now that we've seen the pictures, you can probably already understand what's going on here. We write not f of x equals u here, which would be the more obvious thing because we need to allow for jumps. And at the jump we see f of x is bigger than u. So we write greater or equal. 
And the other thing is, instead of just saying take the unique x which satisfies this, well, after I write greater or equal here, it's not unique anyway, but for the flat case, we need to allow even with equality for several u's. And I said we want the smallest one, so write infimum, which gives us the smallest one. Infimum you can think of as minimum if you don't know what an infimum is. And that especially to account for this case where I said we want the leftmost possible value. And if you go through these three pictures again using this definition, then you will see it checks out, it always does what we want. So the meaning is we try out all x. For each x we check is f of x greater than u. So are we above this line? And then of all x which do this, this here is x starting here, we take the leftmost one, which is the point I laid it f inverse of u. Checks it for all three pictures, it checks out for all three. So that's the formal definition. And using this definition, we have now everything nailed down and we can go and do a proof of the proposition. So the proposition says, if u is standard uniformly distributed and if x is given as f inverse of u, defined in the way we just did, then x has CDF f. So it is clear what we need to do. So we say, let u standard uniform and x defined as f inverse of u. And we want to show x has CDF capital F. So we do probability of x less than or equal to a. And whatever we do, for it to work, we need to end up with f of a here. So we do a chain of equations. We start with this probability and the definition of the CDF says it's the probability of being less than or equal to a. So that is the CDF. And if we're going to show x has CDF capital F, then we need to show that probability equals capital F of a. So that's where we need to end up with. We will now proceed in steps. And the first one is to plug in the definition. So that equals probability of f inverse of capital U being less than or equal to a. And that equals, now I use the definition here, the only change is instead of little u, I plug in this random capital U. So probability of infimum x in R such that f of little x is greater or equal capital U. And that thing is f inverse u, so I need to compare that to little a. That's what I get. Now, that is a bit of a handful. But if we think this through, the next step is actually relatively easy. Namely, so my claim is that the infimum is less than a if and only if f of a is bigger than u. So let's try that out. So we are going to take the set of all x such that f of x is bigger than u. So for this u, we are going to take this set of x, which starts at the mark point and then extends all the way to the right, because for all of these points, f of x is bigger or equal to u. Then we take the infimum. And if this infimum is less than a, that means a is somewhere here. And that means a is one of the points where f of a is bigger than u. So that is one case. The other case is if the infimum is not less than a, so say a is here, the infimum is bigger than a, then you see that is one of the points where f of a is actually strictly less than u, as we were on the right. So that checks out. In both cases, if the infimum is smaller, then f of a was bigger than u. If the infimum is larger, then f of a was strictly smaller than u. And we use this inside the probability. So using this, we can rewrite the probability as probability f of a is greater or equal to u. So that's what we have just shown. And that looks much friendlier. And now we are essentially done. Namely, u is standard uniformly distributed. So we know everything about this. The standard uniform distribution lives on the interval 0 to 1. And f of a being bigger than u really means that u must be less than f of a, so u is somewhere in the hatched region. And now, given that u is uniformly distributed, the probability of hitting this region is proportional to its length. So we need to just work out which fraction of the interval have I just hatched. And the answer is rather straightforward. It's f of a minus 0, that's the length of the hatched region, over 1 minus 0, that's the length of the total interval, equals f of a. And that's what I said we were meant to show. And we have indeed ended up there, so that completes the proof. Good.
that's the theoretical foundation of the method. This completes the first video about this section. In the next video, I'll run you through an example to see how the method can actually be used.